Welcome to the Innovation Meets Leadership Podcast. Real inspiration for real innovators. If you're looking for innovation and leadership transformation, your journey starts now. Welcome to the Innovation Meets Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Natalie Bourne. Hey, would you do me a favor and rate this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts so that other innovators can find this podcast. My guest today is Sean Campbell, and he has over 20 years experience working for Cascade Insights. He's the founder of this firm, and it's a professional services firm that's virtual. So what I'm excited about is we're going to dig in and talk about that a little bit today, because this has been a topic as we've seen a lot of organizations calling people back to work. I love that we are talking about the virtual topic. So welcome to the podcast, Sean. Hey, thanks for having me on. Well, let's dig in and talk a little bit about your career path. How did you come to found the firm? Why virtual? And then let's we'll dive in and talk a little bit about managing remote teams. Sure. The career path is 24 years of owning a business across two businesses. So I had a business called Tree Leaf Solutions, which I think somebody else has the name for some other thing now, you know, because we, we sold that. So I can't even remember what Tree Leaf Solutions is today. That's a funny thing. I go back and look every once in a while, but somebody grabbed the domain name. I think it's some tech consultancy or whatever. Anyway, so I started my first company in 1999. And that company ran to 2006. And then Cascade ran from 2007 to the present. So wow. I've definitely been at Cascade for longer, you know, that's 18 years. And both companies have been predominantly remote over their tenure. However, I've also had offices in both. So it's not like I haven't seen the other side, right? And mm -hmm. clearly I worked in a company before that, although the number of years I've been self-employed greatly exceeds the numbers I have. And I'm 53, so you can do the math of 24 years of business ownership. There wasn't a lot of years where I wasn't owning a business there after college. But yeah, I've always focused on remote companies. And I think there's a lot of strong benefits to it. And I would say I was doing it long before it was cool. I mean, it was a huge negative to be remote Yeah. in 1999. I mean, you would go to someplace mm -hmm. like our two biggest accounts back then were Intel and Microsoft. And the standard refrain was, you don't have an office? And I'm like, you could pay for it. I didn't say it that snarky, yeah, yeah. but I did actually say that. And I said it with a smile and people would go click, click. Oh, you're right. I would pay for it. Yeah, you're right. Because there's not like a magic box in the sky that pays for the expenses, right? Although one funny story on that, just really, it's super quick. It's a little bit of a diversion. But I remember early in my entrepreneurship journey, one of my business partners had a friend and um, their spouse basically said to my business partner's spouse in a conversation about health insurance, like this phrase, well, your company pays for it, right? And my business partner's spouse was like, yes, but that means we pay for it. And she was like, but the company pays for it. <laughs> we we yeah. used to tell that story for years because it's like one of those things that you, you can't really replicate until you own a business, right? There's certain okay. wires that like light up in your brain mm -hmm. that just don't light up, I think. Yeah. And that doesn't mean like you're less of a person. I don't mean that. But I mean, we all have different experiences that expose us to stuff, right? But I always think of that because that's, there's a lot of things like that about owning a company, right? Until you own it, you sometimes can't even really explain what it's like to do you deal with X, right? Yeah. But anyway, long and short of it, yeah, I've been I've been dealing with remote companies for a long time. And, and the last thing I'd say is we've also, through maybe poor strategic planning, although it worked out in the end, I ended up moving from Chicago to Portland. It's the two places I okay. lived. Yeah. And I moved to Portland. And I don't even really think all that much about the fact that it's a hardware town. And most yeah. of my clients are going to be software companies. So I pretty much sold remotely the entire time whether we had an office or not. Like I would sometimes get on a plane to go meet somebody, but all of our clients were always in Seattle, Silicon Valley, some other mm -hmm. place. I mean, it was a rare day where we had somebody local. So I've been basically kind of, basically kind of de remote divide in a way for 20 plus years at this wow. point. Well, that's interesting, you know, and I, I want to talk about the why. So you talked a little bit about cost being a big factor and why to be remote, especially when you're the business owner, right? And you 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 don't want to pass those costs on to companies, but obviously you don't want to incur the cost of, of a building, right? Renting or or purchase yourself. What are some other values of of why remote can be a huge benefit for either business owners or even someone working for a business that's fully remote? 
Well, one thing on cost really fast is that some people probably listening say, well, come on, it can't be that much cost, right? I mean, you know, relative, it's, you know, probably single digit percentages. And I would say, yes. But again, one of those things you only learn if you own a business is there is no such thing as a one year office lease yeah. unless it's a horrible office like really horrible, right? Or it's like a rent office, which then you pay an exorbitant rates. You know, it's really typical for somebody to say, well, how about a five-year lease or seven or 10 when the market's really good, which is which is partly why we have the problem we have now. We're like, all these bosses are like, come back into the building we paid for. We can't get out of it for nine years, right? So there's a commitment issue and then there's a scaling issue, right? Because you buy an office space for a five-year lease and before you know it, you have outgrown it in three years and now you got to sublet mm -hmm. it. Yeah. So, so that's one of those things that I think doesn't get talked about sometimes is it's not just the cost of the office, it's just the mechanisms around it, right? And buying all the junk for the office, the desks and everything else and keeping yeah. everything up to date. So it, it very quickly becomes a real pain in the butt, right? You end up feeling like you almost have to dedicate somebody to just deal with like office moves and addressing it and making sure yeah. that all makes sense. And then we don't even want to get into location issues, right? Like where's a mm -hmm. appropriate place for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the first thing I would say is a benefit is that you can draw talent from anywhere. You know, there's a really great Substack I read. I forget the name of it, a guy named Thomas something. But anyway, he did this really cool Substack recently about the shape of cities. And he said, basically mm -hmm. in short, because I'm a bit of a history buff, histories, are, cities are shaped by the distance you could travel in a half an hour. You can look it up. There's like a mm -hmm. constant that's named for it. So. What's Atlanta now? It's sprawl because, well, you can get pretty far in a half an hour in a car at 90 miles an hour, right? And so, but back in the day, that's why we had a city wall around a small town because you could only really walk like X amount of feet. And his argument is, with remote, it's now continent size. I mean, yeah. you can't really work globally with a remote company. You end up kind of breaking down a little bit at some point because, you know, mm -hmm. India and the U.S., there's a half an hour that overlaps during the yeah. day, right? So it yeah. gets challenging. So then you end up with kind of broken, separate, orbiting in the same universe remote mm -hmm. companies in a way. Yep. I shouldn't say broken, just like separated is what I meant. Yeah. And so you can make a global remote company, but it operates a little differently. So one is talent. Another big benefit, and this is one of the biggest ones for me, is I'm almost missional about the positive impact I feel I can create on the family life of the people mm -hmm. that work for me by allowing them to be remote. Yeah. I, I truly am. I mean, I, it's why I did it for me. I, to this day can have lunch with my sons and they're adulting, they're 21 and 19. So they're not always around at 21 and 19, of course, <laughs> but I can't count the number of times I'm a big Star Trek fan. You know, I'm also a big Star Wars fan. Hence the displays <laughs> behind me on the video, but we watched, all of Voyager, all seven seasons or whatever, when they were young and we just come in and have lunch together, right? The time spent with my wife, you know, I, cause I think some people talk about like commute and everything and sure that's legit. Right. But some yeah. people like that time to decompress. Cause part of the problem with remote is that sometimes you need to walk around the yard for 10 minutes oh, before yes. you come into the house. Right. I do that my all the time. Say, <laughs> yeah. My wife used to say the distance between the office and the kitchen is too short when I used to have yeah. an office in the, in the house and, and there's dynamics to manage you know, mm -hmm. of you and the family, when is he on the call? When is he not on the call? You know, <laughs> there's all that stuff. But seriously, how in the world would I have been around for what I was? Or when mm -hmm. I'm like a baseball coach when they're young, right? It's a lot mm -hmm. easier to just like work till five and walk over to the field 10 minutes okay. away, right? Yeah. I don't even think you could remotely argue for in-person. Uh, this is my case. If even if all you said was, wouldn't the world be a better place if everybody's family was just better? Mm -hmm. Can't guarantee that. I'm not saying like just giving people a remote job makes it better. I mean, if your family's a mess, well, it might make it a little worse too. I mean, I understand that, right? You know, maybe you <laughs> want to be away from each other, but that's a different problem, right? Yes. That's a different issue, right? Yeah. I just, I'm, I'm literally, I'm fairly missional about it because I feel like while I've done all kinds of goodness, I think as a business owner and, you know, done some dumb stuff too, who hasn't as a business owner, but I think... I just provide it in a way for people to be with their kids and their family and their spouses. And, and then the other thing I'd say is, you know, don't forget about the issue of, you know, ableist hiring policies. You know, mm -hmm. what if people have medical conditions, right? Yeah. What if okay. they, there's all kinds of things like that, right? That go yeah. into play. So I've also got the ability to deal with that. And I, the very last thing, I mean, I could give you a list of 20 benefits, mm -hmm. but I'd say one of the other benefits is just diversity of perspective. Yeah. That's right. Right. I got people from Oklahoma and from Boston and from Chicago and from Oregon. And, you know, we all know the country's different, right? Just in the U.S., right? Yeah. We know people are different, right? I was 
different in Chicago temperament wise than I kind of had to be when I was out here in Oregon after 20 plus years. Right. Yeah. So I don't think I've ever left the Chicago and entirely nobody ever really leaves their hometown. Right. <laughs> entirely. But it sneaks out all the time. But but I, I benefit from that. The company yeah. benefits from that. Our clients benefit from that. And, and one last thing, what's so weird to me and feels so dis and feels so distant when like these large companies say, y'all got to come back to the office or like Dell, who about a month ago said, you're not going to get promoted unless you come back to the office. And I'm like, well, besides the court case and all the competitors <laughs> probably picking employees that both of which are on their way and the stupidity of this, they're losing the ability to have a diversity of perspectives, mm -hmm. right? Like they just are. And, and I'm like, why would you do that? I just, yeah. I, I, I don't get it. And, and, and I'm not saying having a remote company doesn't have challenges. We could get to those and things you have to implement. Yeah. But I just, I cannot see how the ledger doesn't weigh out in the ultimate sense when you add all those things up. Yeah. As a guy said on one of my LinkedIn posts on this one day, he said, how in the world can remote companies not outperform in-person companies? after yeah. 20 years, like yeah. how, how, how could they not? Yeah. And I know somebody's listening and going, I've got eight reasons. And I'm like, well, <laughs> show up on the show, you know, well, right. maybe we'll end up right, dealing right. with those in a couple minutes. I don't yeah. know. Well, but, I think we will touch on some of these, but yeah. you know, I wanted to make a comment to you about what you said from the family perspective. I, I think about someone that I really greatly respect their career and their work that they've done, which was Jack Welsh. And I remember reading some things about him towards the end of his life where he said he wished that he had spent more time investing in his family. And this guy was a what I would call probably a workaholic when you look at his background oh, sure. and all that he did. And for him to look back on his life and be like, man, was this really the best place to have put all my effort and energy? I think we now know, you know, and especially I think 2020 was like a jar, jarring wake up for a lot of people. But I think we all know, like, the answer to that is no. Like, you need to create that. And I like something that Jack Welch said, which was work-life choices. It's not work-life balance. It's really choices. Every day we're making choices that either, you know, positively impact us at work, but may negatively impact us at home. And to me, you know, just traveling in a, you know, I live in Atlanta. So when you were mentioning Atlanta and just, I mean, you know, where I live to where I may travel, it could be an hour and a half in just one direction. Oh, and, and then I picked out Atlanta to... for that reason. I'd forgotten you were from Atlanta, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally, no, I mean, I, it's much real. like Chicago or some of the bigger cities. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's or the Bay. It's, I was once in a three hour traffic jam just to yep. get from the South Bay to Oakland. That's you right. You know, what, so, you know? So these are real things. And I think that, you know, the, the issue is if you redeploy yourself to more work, then you didn't solve anything. But if you can redeploy yourself to, that walk and maybe include your family or sit down and watch that show or have lunch together, then you do really kind of get to meaning in some of these areas where I think people are grappling with today. And maybe it's, you need to spend better time figuring out how, how to, you know, maybe you can use that time to go to counseling with your family if you don't get along. Right. But whatever it is, I think we need to think about the fact that, you know, work is is kind of the face of work is changing and there is flexibility out there so how can you deploy yourself and your talents but still be really wise with what you're doing and i think that that's some of what you're leaning into which i think is super helpful for us all to sit and reflect on because it's it's not something to just run past you 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 talk really fast but we need to slow that down and go back and listen again because i think you're saying some really important principles that maybe some of us haven't thought about in a couple of years since 2020, but we need to go back and think about these things and think about how we deploy our effort and energy because life is short. And if it's all about work, we're missing out on the bigger piece of the puzzle. And I think remote work lends itself nicely to that to say, build in a walk, build in time to have lunch, build in time for connection. I mean, it's a really nice part of the remote work aspect. Yeah. And I would say two quick things on what you said. One, other people have noted this before me and we knew it long before they did research studies on kids. Presence. Yeah. Presence beats anything. Mm -hmm. Presence beats a gift. Presence, more presence beats small amounts of focus presence. Presence beats an activity. 
your child just wants you around. Yeah. And if that sounds a little preachy, I think it is intentionally. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I think we all know your kid pops off the bus or however they get home. <laughs> at 2.50, you can, might get 20 minutes of what happened at school. Yeah. At 7.50 at bedtime, you're lucky if you'd get two minutes. Yes. It, that That is just the way humans are, right? And I I don't know what replaces that. And there, mm-hmm. to your point, there's other benefits. There's recharge time, whatever. And a side note, I don't really bring this up hardly ever. Some, and I should because I'm, I'm I live in a beautiful state, Oregon, right? So it's hard not to be pro-environment. And I know that phrase means different things to different people. So you can read into that, whatever that may or may not think about what I think about it, but I'm definitely pro environment. And I always think of the studies and it only happened for a little while because we were only locked down intensely for a very yeah. short period, but LA, no smog places. You could see the stars. You couldn't see anymore rivers that were just a little cleaner by a couple yeah. point, points, right? Yeah. Well, you know, there's, there's a cost to us moving around all the time. Right. You know, yeah. and, and that, that is something to consider, right? And I just, you know, I think it's, I think it's a mess. And one thing about the culture side on the companies too, there's definitely this, Hey, we bought this big office tower. We need you to all come back. Right. But I think another big miss, and this goes all the way back to COVID managers were not trained how to manage remote teams. Yeah. They just weren't. And there are things you have to do differently in a remote company. And what they did is they just threw the, through the manager out there and because the manager because the manager was using by sight mm-hmm. if you think of it that way right which is fine that's legit right we've done that for generations they didn't really know how to manage otherwise and what really frustrated me about that was and i know employees were frustrated about it mm-hmm. is all that went down and this is the way i think the dynamic went in almost nearly every company ca ceo said we're gonna bring people back i i think people are non-productive i i think they're watching netflix and so the message was, hey, employees, you suck. You haven't been doing a good job. And even if that was happening in some cases, you know what I never heard once ever? Hey, middle management, did you know how to manage remote employees? No. Did we equip you? Did we talk about it? And the manager, honestly, to be fair, they kind of duck some responsibility too. I've seen a lot of dynamic of, yeah, you're right. You're right, Mr. CEO. Yep, yep, Netflix. That's what it is. I had no idea to know what they were doing, but I won't bring that up. I, you, you know, I there was this huge thing that I think we're going to write 10 years from now of like the middle management wasn't trained. That's right. Yeah, this is powerful. I think, so let's, let's talk a little bit about this and let's get into communication and remote teams because I think this is... Part of what you're saying, it's let's talk communication, but then let's also give us a little bit on like, how do you onboard and set expectations as well as part of this conversation? Yeah, maybe we start with onboarding because it kind of flows toward day to day activity. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like you get onboarded and then you have to communicate daily, you know? So if we start with onboarding, one of the biggest things is having what other people have called an SSOT, a single source of truth. Mm -hmm. And that single source of truth usually is poorly invested in. There are some great examples of it. Uh, Basecamp yeah. puts it out publicly. Uh, GitHub actually has mm-hmm. a version of it. Because honestly, if you write a single source of truth about your culture and your principles and your processes and your workflows, you're going to you're gonna be able to actually, to some extent, even market that to allow people to, the, the less sensitive nature of the pieces of it, to mm-hmm. maybe even for recruiting. But you need to invest in that. And most companies don't. That's really the fundamental problem. I think they band-aid that with management by site Mm -hmm. and they kind of have some rough process documents, but that's about it. And you, that's one of the bigger things I would say is that you have to have this single source of truth and you have to invest in it over time. And once you have it, I think people are a lot more effective in general too. So that's, Mm -hmm. that's one thing I would say. and, And one other quick thing on single source of truth, there's so many fun ways that you can put one together now. Like it does not have to be a document. Like you might've seen, that Reed Hoffman of LinkedIn fame got a Cynthia, C- Cynthia, all these domain names are sometimes hard to say, <laughs> version of himself. I used to say all the good domain names are taken. So we always have these like weird names now that we get to deal with, right? Like six consonants followed by a vowel or something like that. And so Reed does a an avatar of himself and he has the avatar interview him and they interview each other. It's on the internet. <laughs> so you can do this with a best practice doc. You can just go create an AI avatar. I'm actually going to do it with ours. It's not that mm-hmm. hard. Like, I think you just need the $100 a month Cincia plan. 
and you do, do some training video and you're good. So you can make it interactive or you could make like a custom GPT with chat GPT. And that's really mm -hmm. easy to do. Again, you just feed it your best practices documents and people can chat with the documents because I think people hear single source of truth and wow, lots of writing, lots of documentation. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, but even there, like you can start small and let the people you're onboarding contribute. You know, to me, mm -hmm. that's a living document. You know, yeah. if there's a part of the process that isn't documented yet, you're bringing somebody on, especially in certain positions, you know, mm -hmm. like ours where we've got relatively senior people, yeah. they can contribute to that, right? So that's that's the very, very first thing I think people need. I the The second thing that I always emphasize with remote onboarding is an emphasis on principles over process. Hmm. Because the book of process, which is only part of the SSOT, principles are part of it too, always runs out of pages. Hmm. I don't care what the job is. I mean, unless it's making chicken McNuggets or mowing your lawn, nothing against those jobs. Those you can give somebody a process and they can do it and they don't really need maybe a principle, right? Mm -hmm. But any moderately complex job, which by the way, is usually the ones that people are working remotely. I mean, we haven't reached the point that remote jobs involve lawn mowing, right? So yeah. most of these jobs are basically between your ears kind of jobs, which means that it's probably really hard to write down all the processes and procedures that that person could follow and generate a good outcome. There's a degree of variability. And mm -hmm. right there is where a principle comes into play. Because if you can orient your organization around really clear principles, when that employee is remote and they're not sure what to do next, because there's always a bit of async lag in a remote company. That's one of the yeah. easiest things people can knock. I can't solve the problem immediately. And I'm like, well, in an in-person company, you can't always get a meeting. In That's large right. companies, you yeah. can't even get a conference room. I used to joke they should have a building full of conference rooms on like major campuses. They still wouldn't have enough conference rooms, right? Mm -hmm. So what does that employee do when they're unsure what to do next? Mm -hmm. And if they have a principle, it, it's like steering a boat, if anybody's driven a boat, right? Boats don't ever really, small boats at least, because I've got a small fishing boat, they don't ever really go in a straight line. They kind of like, they kind of like maneuver a couple degrees off the line because it's the wind and the current and everything else. You know, we're not talking about a cruise liner that's kind of like just on cement driving forward, right? And what that principle does is lets them stay oriented toward a goal while they're waiting for a response. And I, I have found that immeasurably helpful because even if it takes a whole day in a worst case scenario for somebody to organize a meeting or connect, if they know the principles upon which we operate, they'll go do that. And a related thing, this is the last thing I mentioned, we can get into more stuff, but is from the very first day, you have to let people feel comfortable showing their ignorance. And I realize that's kind of a slightly sensitive word, but I, I, I feel that's the right one because it needs to be stated strongly. And what I mean by that is in most in-person companies, when you are unclear as to what to do next, there's a little bit of this dynamic. Hmm. Who's the safest person to talk to? Mary, Bob. Hey, hmm. Bob, you know, I was kind of unsure about, you know, this thing. And, you know, what do you, what do you think? Can you come over and look? Okay. And the reason I did it that way is not because I don't know how to remove all those filler words, but it's just, that's the way we talk, right? And we're doing it in a way that feels safe socially. Now flip hmm. this around. What is it? What has to happen in a remote company? You're stuck. It's 1 p.m. There's no meeting scheduled for today. Slack message. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> right. It looks worse in writing. Yeah. Kind of right. has to, right? Right. Because you don't have all the rest of the goop around it. That's worse right. yet, you're sending it to your boss, right? Yeah. You know, I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, most employees think the number of times I tell my boss I don't know what I'm doing if it exceeds more than five in a month, it's going in my file or maybe right, less, right. right? And so in a remote company though, you have to build this culture from the very, very first day. And if it sounds like I have to kind of pound it into people, I kind of do because we hire people sometimes that come from hybrid or in-person or just poorly functioning remote environments. Yeah. And I have to be like, look, I really, really mean it. If you get stuck, I need the flare to go out like immediately and I need you to not self filter on yeah. I'll try to figure it out myself or I'm not really sure, or maybe I'll kind of struggle for a while. Yeah, and that's where you get the productivity loss. 
that's where when people were, I, I think we're going to find 20 years from now when they do all the sociology studies, because because COVID and remote must be like a boon if you're a PhD sociologist, right? You must just be like clapping your hands with glee. You're like, there are so many things I get to study because we yeah. put the world in a blender. And I think ultimately we we're going to find that it was, it was that. Mm -hmm. It was people's inability through probably reasonable thought process. Like, I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to like have this audit trail. I didn't know what to do that they got stuck and they hung out in a while. And I, and I find that once somebody's here a few weeks and they're like, you were like, right. Like nobody's doing that. Now we're like every company. If you screw up the same thing eight times in a row after yeah. you've been told what to do, right. That's different. <laughs> that, but that's different. We're talking about the willingness to say it the first time and get meaningful feedback. Right. Yeah. And, and I just think it's different in an office. That doesn't yeah. make the office better. It just means that you've got to manage to that. That's right. This is great. So I can't believe it. Almost out of time. I want to know if someone is thinking about either staying remote or maybe they their organization is talking about going remote. Give us just in maybe 60 seconds what are the three principles or what are the three things they need to be just mindful of around this conversation we've had today that, that they need to put in place for their organization? Single source of truth. I would also emphasize written communication skills. Mark Twain mm -hmm. once said, I would have written you a shorter letter, but I didn't have the time. Right. I think because most calm is async at the start right? Async leads to sync in a mm -hmm. remote company. You have to have people who can communicate well in the written word. And I think it's probably an objective fact that that's just gotten worse in America yeah. over a hundred yeah. years, right? So that, that's a big thing. I would also say emphasize good virtual public speaking skills. And we didn't get into that. I, I, you know, folks can see resources on our site that we've talked about a few times about it, or just even look it up yourself. There's plenty of things like that. I think there's a lot of discussion about whether Zoom is good or bad, right? And I'll close it by this. I think the idea that 2D is worse than 3D when it comes to Zoom is easily blown away by two obvious facts. One, people watch podcasts like this. They seem appropriately entertained. So yeah. I don't think I don't <laughs> think 2D is inherently bad. And last time I heard there's this thing called television and YouTube, and that's also 2D. <laughs> So until we're all wearing Apple Vision headsets, I don't think it's true that you have an engagement issue with 2D. I think maybe we haven't trained people how to do that. And very, very last thing, I know it's a little over 60 seconds. <laughs> Great tip for individuals. There's nothing in our history as humans that has led us to watch ourselves while we communicate. Mm, yeah, that's real. Hide self-view. It's right there. It's a button. Nobody knows you did it. Yeah. You know, and I say that to people, and a lot of people go, huh, you mean I can? <laughs> I'm like, yes, you can, yeah. you're of it. And because some of us who do, who maybe do podcasts or teach or whatever, we're a little more used to seeing our own head. That's right. But it's, it's, it's a mess if you're not used to it, right? It kind of yeah. plays with your brain because you're like watching yourself communicate while you're talking, you're yeah. trying to pick up reactions. It's the simplest thing. And I just think there could be a lot more training about that. Yeah. And that if you, if you, are, especially if you're hiring people who worked in person, that's some really big stuff that you got to do the first day. So they, they feel more comfortable and they engage more, but those yeah. are some of the biggest tips. I love it. This has been such a great conversation. Very engaging. I just picked up a lot of thoughts and tips myself. So thank you so much for your time today, Sean. This has been amazing. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. All right. To follow Sean, you can head over to Sean Campbell. That's his uh, LinkedIn. And you can also go to cascadeinsights.com to learn a little bit more. This will also be in our show notes. Well, to our listeners, thank you for joining the Innovation Meets Leadership podcast. Remember, don't just get out of the box, but break the box and set it on fire. Let's go transform something. Thank you for joining us for the Innovation Meets Leadership podcast. Be sure to subscribe to our show on iTunes. Follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Innovation Meets Leadership. And visit our site at innovationmeetsleadership.com for more innovation resources. 
Hey, my new book is out, Set It on Fire, The Art of Innovation. Click on the link to learn more. And don't just get out of the box, break the box and set it on fire.